What's up, everybody? Welcome to My Killer Podcast. I am your host, Mel. 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 Does anybody ever feel really weird about saying their own name? I don't know. It just never sounds quite right when it's coming out of my mouth. Mel. Hi, my name's Mel. I'm your host, Mel. <laughs> anyway, so I'm not normally one that gets into these conversations very often, but I heard a dirty rumor that um, cancel culture was trying to cancel Eminem. Is that true? Has anybody, has anybody else heard this dirty rumor? I'm not going to talk about this a whole bunch, but it's pretty ballsy for them to go after Eminem because He's a very outspoken individual and he's very popular. The only thing that I'm gonna really say about this topic and then we're just gonna move the fuck on is you need to be careful. You are towing a very fine line of canceling freedom of speech. Now, if we start getting into the realm of people not having freedom of speech becomes a normal thing, then big man, Big man out there is gonna cancel, cancel freedom of speech, not just for Eminem, but for you, for me, for everyone. So you need to be careful because you cancel cultures are about to put us in the way, way back machine. We have fought too long and too hard in our lives and generations past for these freedoms that we have today, such as freedom of speech. So I just want to say, tread lightly, because I like to have my freedoms, and I'm sure you like to have your freedoms too. Please don't toss us back into history where we didn't have these things. That's all I'm going to say about that. Moving on, today we are going to talk about willies. I have so many of these little jokes in my pocket, I don't know if I'm going to be able to refrain myself from saying them all. Today we're going to be talking about a little ditty called Willy's Wonderland. I am super excited to be talking about this movie. I have anticipated the release for so long now and I refused to stream it. I did not want this movie to be just another movie in my list of movies where I just couldn't wait to see it. So I paid for it on Vudu or something like that. And then I watched it at, you know, an incredibly low quality and, and all of that. No, I wanted to wait for the release. So I pre-ordered my Willie's copy, but I'm not going to lie people. I'm a little disappointed. Willie's Wonderland had such a cult following before the release even came out. It had, like so many people were anticipating this release. So many people were excited for it to come out and they were waiting for so long for this release. And there's tons of pre-orders and everything like that. But I'm not going to lie. When I got my pre-order in the mail on release day, I was, I was fucking disappointed <laughs> because this is how it came to me. It didn't have a slip cover. It's just in a regular Blu-ray blue case. It, it doesn't even have the poster art artwork on the front. Um, and when you open the, the Blu-ray, there is artwork on the disc, but there's nothing else. The Blu-ray case is completely empty. All there is is a disc inside. I just felt like this being so anticipated and it having such a cult following that they would have taken advantage of that and had some special edition releases or at the very least given this fucking blu-ray a slip cover you know or a steelbook release or something but no it's just it's a regular blu-ray and i watched all the special features and to be honest with you they weren't that incredibly great either there was like three making of interview situations and they were all like fucking five to ten minutes long i don't know i was just really disappointed in this release i maybe i was just so disappointed because i waited so long for it screen media what are you doing what are you doing the poster art as a slip cover for this movie would have been fan freaking tastic 
it would have been fucking amazing. But I'm not going to be too disappointed because the movie itself was incredible. So there's that anyway. But the Blu-ray, it's 89 minutes. It was distributed by Screen Media. All right, so its release date was February 2021, directed by Kevin Lewis. It had a budget of $5 million. Nicolas Cage was a producer on this movie, um, as well as Grant Kramer, Jeremy Davis, Brian Lord, Mike Millen, and David Ozer. It stars Nicolas Cage as the janitor, Emily Tosta as Liv, Camilla Arrington as Little Liv. There's a kid in this movie. Beth Grant as the sheriff, David Sheftel as deputy, Evan, Rick Reitz as Tex Macchiadu, Chris Warner as Jed Love, Kai Cadillac as Chris Newley, Kaylee Crowen as Kathy Barnes, and so on and so forth. <laughs> as far as rating goes, it got a 5.5 out of 10 on IMDb. Not sure what's happening there. 64% on Rotten Tomatoes. And of course, where we know our hearts lie truly is in the Google user reviews and ratings, which is 87%. High five to you guys. Ah. Willy's Wonderland um, is an American action comedy horror. The screenplay was written by O.G. Parsons. The film stars Nicolas Cage, who also is a producer. It follows a quiet drifter who is tricked into cleaning up an abandoned family entertainment center haunted by eight murderous animatronic characters. So the project was originally announced in October 2019. Parsons originally conceived the idea based off of his short film that he wrote in 2016 called Wally's Wonderland. They chose to change the title later on to Willy's Wonderland. It's kind of a little iffy as to why they did that, but it probably had something to do with money, I'm assuming. However, the short film caught Nicolas Cage's attention, who shortly after agreed to participate in, as an actor and a producer. Director Lewis was hired in December of 2019, while the rest of the cast was brought in in 2020. Prior to its release, the film received a small cult following due to sharing the premise with Five Nights at Freddy's franchise, which I, I think is like a video game. I don't really know much about that. However, the small cult following is kind of inaccurate because I believe it actually had a very large cult following before the release of this movie. It was originally supposed to release in October of 2020, but of course, due to COVID pandemic, they pushed it off until this year, which has happened to a lot of movies. It was released through video on demand with a simultaneous limited theatrical release in the United States on in February 2021 by Screen Media Films. The film received generally positive reviews from critics with praise for Cage's performance and the animatronics realistic movements which you you can definitely see that in the movie. Principal photography began in 2020 in various parts of Atlanta, Georgia. The, the crew used a desolated bowling alley in Sprayberry Crossing Shopping Center in East Cobb, Marriott for the fictional Willie's Wonderland Family Entertainment Center, setting up a huge base camp with housing facilities for the crew members. That was due to COVID restrictions. Special effects for the film were done by production designer Molly Coffey, whose expertise in design and fabrication with puppetry helped to create the visual movements and appearance of the eight animatronic characters, which gets all of the praise in the world. An interview with Geo Parsons stated that he had an idea for a sequel of the film if it gets enough support in February 2021. It was stated that the sequel is being actively discussed, which I also watched an interview with the director Lewis, and he is also actively brainstorming ideas for a sequel. So that that fills my heart. I am super excited to know that they're already talking about sequels. The only thing would be is if um, Cage was on board. Of course, if there was a sequel, everybody would want him to be in it and it wouldn't be a sequel without him. Director Kevin Lewis has a small rap sheet of um, directorial movies prior to this, uh, some of which are The Third Nail, 2007, The Drop, 2006, Dark Heart, also 2006, Malibu Spring Break, 2003, Downward Angel, 2001, Andrew Jackson, White Elk, 1998, and The Method, 1996. However, in his interview, he also stated that 
this movie in particular was a huge eye opener for him and it really brought in his horizons in the ways of the specific movies that he has directed or wants to direct in the future because this is clearly a horror comedy and he had not directed one of those before but it's opened his eyes to different projects that he may want to pursue in the future so that's pretty exciting uh, more from the interview with the director him and cage pretty much had the same ideas as to what the character of the janitor was supposed to be they both agreed that no speaking lines was preferred and Cage took an approach to his character where he just had no respect for these animatronics whatsoever and Lewis was completely on board with that. But he also talks a lot about how he wanted this movie to be fast paced. He wanted it to be like a bullet, which kind of contradicts some of the reviews that are out there where people were stating that it seemed kind of slow, but he disagrees with that statement because he specifically was trying to make this movie more fast paced. And in doing that, he cut out a lot of informational scenes in the movie because they just, they were bogging it down a little bit. So he cut some of that stuff out to make it more fast paced, which me and watching the movie, I agree. I don't feel like that. I don't feel like this movie was um, a slow burn by any means because like right away in the beginning, you get this amazing like speeding car action scene almost. <laughs> and then after that, Cage immediately meets the tow truck driver who takes him essentially takes him to his destination and then he you know let the killing begin <laughs> although lewis does love good slow burn movies he talked a lot about jaws and how you know that movie is clearly a slow burn but it's for a reason because the movie builds up anticipation for that amazing end but he was also thinking that people nowadays are just so hyper connected that they're not they're not going to want a slow burn movie they want they want to see the action they want to see it happen now so that's another reason why he decided to make this movie, like he quoted, a shooting bullet. And Charles Bronson was a huge inspiration for Cage as he was developing this character. And I, for one, am super fucking excited to see Cage get his freak out, you know? We all know deep in his heart, he is freaky deaky as fuck. We know this about you, Nicolas Cage. We have all seen Vampires Kiss which is an old ass movie. So we know it was in you all along and I am super excited to see these B-horror movies starring Nicolas Cage come out where he is just letting his inner freak shine and he is just putting everything into his acting of these characters and he is just, he's taking it to the 10th level and I hope we keep getting movies like this from him, like Willy's Wonderland and Mandy and all of the other movies that he just lets his freaky deaky side shine. And Lewis also agrees that we need more movies like Willy's Wonderland out there. We need movies that are fun and comedic, but yet can also be horror movies because with the pandemic today, people just don't want to be bogged down with a bunch of feely feels, you know? People want movies where they can just walk in, it's a fun little watch, they can turn their mind off, they're completely entertained, have some movies that they can laugh to, you know? With everything that's going on in the world right now, I don't think that's a bad thing. I, I was thoroughly entertained with this movie and I'm super glad that I could just turn my brain off for a minute, so I agree with him 100%. That's part of the reason why I loved Willies so much. Did you love Willies? Do you love Willies? <laughs> Willie's Wonderland, that is. <laughs> so a little bit about the making of this movie is they they only had three shot takes and one month of shooting as a time frame to make this movie. Some of the things took quite a bit of time. One of the characters, Ozzy, he was the giant bird, ostrich bird. That was the only puppet in this movie. The rest of the animatronic characters were uh, stunt people in suits. But because Ozzy was such a big character and he had such a long neck and he had such a wide range of movement, they had to have two puppeteers behind this bird and they were wearing green suits and they were taken out in post editing. But he was a very difficult character to maneuver and make it look realistic. So after, clearly he's the first puppet to die. But after that, it was kind of more smooth sailing in the ways of 
shot takes because he took a lot of time and he took a lot of shots to get his character to look right and act right in all of the things. A lot of the special effects in this movie are practical effects, so I applaud you guys for that. There were some CGI moments in this movie, but it was mostly just um, details to add to the story. Uh, the gorilla's tongue was one of them and they used CGI to take reflections out of sunglasses and just kind of things like that. They're just little things adding to the story. They weren't building worlds with the CGI. Most of the things were practical effects, which you know me, I love my practical effects. They look real and gruesome and gross and come on, everybody wants practical effects over CGI any day. I would have been really disappointed in my willies if there was a bunch of CGI moments. But one of the things that I did learn that I thought was really funny is Cage kicked the shit out of these animatronic characters. <laughs> so what they had to do is they had to take the stuntmen out of their costumes and then they would let Cage just have his way with these Willy's <laughs> characters. And he would just beat the fuck out of these suits so bad that like it, essentially he was ruining them. <laughs> So a couple of times they had to like, a couple of times they had to fix the suits because they clearly needed to be in other shots of the movie because he just traumatized them so much, which are some of my favorite parts of this movie. <laughs> and once again, there are talks of a sequel. Uh, Director Lewis has been brainstorming ideas about a sequel, what they think is going to what they think should happen, what can happen, where it's going to happen. But I feel like this movie does a great job in setting up what could be a, a good sequel because there's little Easter eggs throughout this movie that make, that make you think that there's definitely more to the story. And I'll get into some of that when we start talking about the movie in its entirety. But a sequel could be coming, so that's very exciting. And I hope Cage is involved <laughs> because it wouldn't be Willy's without Cage. <laughs> Willies and Kate. Okay, I'm not gonna do that. But a killer fact, and this is kind of horrifying, is uh, Kevin Lewis almost fucking died, I guess, during the making of Willie's Wonderland because he came down with COVID and he just had the perfect storm in his body of debilitating things happening that made COVID so detrimental to his body. He was in the hospital and, um, he was, he even got to a point where he was like calling people and telling them goodbye. Like his diagnosis was not great, but he ended up pulling through. He's alive. He lived, he lives on to make a sequel for us. <laughs> not saying that that's what pushed him through, but, but yeah, that's crazy. It's, it's absolutely crazy to hear that. I got that information from an interview. So it is from him that I, that I learned that, uh, the, the Blu-ray did have some special features on it, like I alluded to. They weren't great. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you they weren't great, but one of them was the making of Willies. <laughs> um Nick Cage has an interview on there and he talks about how he he likes weird and obscure things and he actually references killer clowns from outer space which is one of my like all time favorite childhood movies. Um, and he, he loved that movie because it was just kind of weird and out there. So he kind of likes the same movies that I do. So that kind of warms my heart just a little bit. And then he goes into talking a little bit about the costumes themselves and, and how they had to age the costumes throughout the movie. Because there are parts in the movie where it shows Willy's Wonderland in the beginning where the costumes are pristine and beautiful. And then uh, they go over a 20 year span so by the end of the 20 years clearly these costumes have to be grungy and they've you know been used to murder but what he wants people to take away from this movie he wants people to take away from this movie whatever they want he doesn't want it to be explained away and he wants them to be entertained he wants people to be entertained by this movie he put a lot of thought and effort into making this movie unique and out there and funny but also gruesome so he just wants people to be able to be entertained this is exactly what kevin lewis was saying is this is the exactly the type of movie that people need they need they need to be entertained and they don't want to be too thought provoked in the time that this world is in right now so to name our eight animatronic characters just so everybody knows who they are we have Artie Alligator, Cammy Chameleon, Gus Gorilla, Nighty Knight, 
Ozzy Ostrich, Serene Sarah, Tito Turtle, and Willie Weasel. Who's your favorite Willies? <laughs> Who's your favorite Willie character? <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, Serene Sarah kind of scared me a little bit. She was freaky deaky. But apparently in the original Wally's Wonderland version, short story version of this movie, the characters were a little bit different. It was Cage's idea to add the, rept the reptiles to this movie, but they, re they replaced like, I guess a bunny and like a penguin or something like that. But apparently Cage is like big into reptiles, so he wanted some of those in the movie, which I think is great. I liked the wide variety of animatronics that they had. The only one that didn't really make that much sense to me was Serene Sarah. Because she was like a person, right? Or a fairy. I think she was supposed to be a fairy, maybe. And then the rest of them are animals. So I'm not really sure. I was kind of hoping to learn why maybe she was different than the rest of them. I never did end up coming across anything about that, but it doesn't make that much difference to me. She was horrifying though, in general. Also, just a heads up, we are gonna be talking about this movie in its entirety. So if you have not seen Willy's Wonderland, pause, stop, go watch it, then come back to me and we can have a talk about so let's talk about willies. <laughs> shall we? Shall we dive into? Should we do a deep dive into willies? Should we do the whole willies deep dive? I'm gonna stop with those. Should I stop with those? They're not even very funny. I thought they'd be funnier, but they're really not. Anyway, the movie opens up into a scene where a woman and man, they look really scared. Uh, they're in this hallway. There's this these metallic sounds happening around them and they start running they're they're clearly scared and they're running down this hallway and the man just gets taken away immediately you don't see what takes him he just falls and he's being dr drug back into darkness by an unknown entity at this point and the woman just she keeps running and she ends up in this room and then the lights start exploding around her and she sees a child and the child is crying and the woman screams and then all of a sudden there's just like this splatter of blood and then the opening credits happen. And during the opening credits is this just amazing car driving down the road very fast. It's not a car chase scene, but it's like a very fast car driving around doing all these like fun turns and weaving on the highway and stuff like that. And I don't know if anybody else caught this or saw this on the movie. I'm sure that you did because the camera like zooms in on it, but there are dog tags hanging from the mirror. Now, are they still called dog tags? They're military nameplates it, are hanging from a chain from the rear view mirror, but are they still called dog tags? Because I think when I was a kid, that's what we used to call them were dog tags. So I don't know if we're supposed to take from that that Nicolas Cage is a military man of some sort but he's credited as the janitor. His name, which nobody ever calls him his name, but he is he's credited and known as the janitor. But he has these military name tags hanging from his rearview mirror, so I don't which would make sense with the theme of the movie because he kind of goes into goes into Willie's and he he's not scared of anything and he kicks fucking ass throughout the entire movie so it would make sense if he had some kind of military training in his background or something but then it cuts right away from that and then it's never talked about again which clearly why would it because Nicolas Cage doesn't say a, a thing in this movie he speaks not one word in this entire movie but he ends up running over some road spikes which why the fuck they were there I don't I don't know it seems kind of fishy but he gets a flat tire and then he gets out he sees his flat tire. Apparently he doesn't have a spare in his car or something. I mean, even I have a spare. I can't change it. I'm <laughs> playing the little girl. <laughs> not saying anything against women who can't do their own things, but I am like just physically not strong enough to get those nuts off of there. 
I'm gonna die during this episode if I keep talking about willies and nuts, I'm just saying. Anyway, so it shows him just like leaning up against his car and you, and there's like a time lapse. So you just see his shadow panning over the car in the ground. So it's implying that many an hour has gone by that he's just stood there, not even moving. So he's clearly a very special person, different kind of dude. But along comes a tow truck. Conveniently enough, a guy in a tow truck pulls up, hooks up his car, and tows him away. So that's happened. That's what happens with that. <laughs> and then we cut to, we get our first glimpse of Liv, who I would say ultimately is the other main character of this movie. But she's just, she's this girl. She's at Willy's Wonderland right now. And this is the first glimpse you get to see of Willy's Wonderland in the movie. And she's pouring gasoline everywhere. And she's about to fucking light the shit on fire. And then the sheriff pulls up and arrests her, which the sheriff is like this old lady. And she takes her back to a trailer, which is kind of, in, you get this feeling that maybe the sheriff is the caretaker of Liv. But she handcuffs her to the heater and just is about to leave her there. <laughs> And Liv is like, where are you going? You can't leave me here like this, you know? And she's like, how am I supposed to eat? How am I supposed to take a piss? <laughs> it's one of her quotes in the movie. And the sheriff just spouts back to her. There's chips on the coffee table and a bucket on the floor. Try not to make a mess. <laughs> can, you imagine, can you imagine being handcuffed to a, a, like a, one of those registered heaters? and you're trying to piss in a bucket and grab chips off of a table. I don't know. So then we cut back to the janitor on his journey to getting his car fixed and you see the tow truck pull up to the shop and Cage walks in and there's just all these pictures of missing persons all over the wall. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's a little fishy as to why all of these people are missing from this like weird little town and the tow truck driver is like, yeah, man, I can fix this. It's going to be like a thousand bucks, but it's cash only, dude. And Cage clearly doesn't have that much money in cash. He only has a card. And then he looks at the ATM machine and it's out of order, conveniently enough. And the guy's like, sorry, dude, cash only. And so Cage, you know, he's not saying anything, but with his facial expressions is implying like, hey, I don't, how the fuck am I supposed to pay then? And the guy kind of just catches on to that. I don't know what I want to call him. Do I want to call him the janitor through this or do I want to call him Cage? Oh, fuck you know. So the tow truck driver, he ends up just asking Nicholas Cage's character, the janitor, if he's willing to work off his money because he knows a guy that has Willy's Wonderland and he's trying to fix it up and he's trying to reopen it and he, he needs some help. So if Cage goes in there and cleans up a bit, then that guy will pay to have his car fixed and all's well. So clearly that's what happens. So he meets up with Tex at Willie's Wonderland and it's he's just this straight up cowboy guy with you know the hat, the suit, the boots, the mustache, all the things. And he agrees that he'll clean up Willie's Wonderland for the entire fucking night in exchange for Tex paying to have his car fixed. Shake on it and everything. So Tex kind of starts showing him around and showing him everything that he wants him to do. He shows him the cleaning closet. There's a stack of Willie's Wonderland shirts in there. He gives him a shirt and he's like, you're part of the crew now. And he tells him to help himself to whatever is in the kitchen in the ways of food and to, to pace himself. Make sure he takes breaks, <laughs> which I thought was kind of weird. It's like, what? Who the fuck cares if he takes a break or not? Like, even if your intention isn't to kill this motherfucker, why would you give a shit if he takes a break? That, I don't know. That just seemed weird. But I guess, you know, the guy is luring him there as a human sacrifice, so he probably is a little fucking weird. But, you know, the janitor takes him at his word for that one, which we'll talk about in a minute. So Tex walks out, meets back up with the tow truck driver, and he says, quote, let's get the hell out of here. I can't stand to hear a grown man scream. So they're, you know, they're putting little... Easter eggs here and there to tell you that the situation is fucked beyond belief, which we all kind of know that just based off of reading the synopsis and everything. So meanwhile, back at the trailer, uh, these random group of hooligans show up to 
save Liv from her predicament that she's in. And they get her unlocked and she kind of tells them like, hey, I saw this guy with the, with, you know, the tow truck driver. So clearly he's probably at Willie's quote unquote cleaning up the place, which really is just code for he's gonna fucking die. So now Liv has made it her mission to go save this guy and burn down Willie's. Like she is just, she was already trying to burn down Willie's in the beginning, was stopped by the sheriff. Now she wants to go back and try again. She's on a mission and we're gonna find out why. So the kids take off and they're heading to Willie's right now. Nick, however, the janitor, AKA Nicholas Cage, however, <laughs> <laughs> has changed into his wonderful Willy's Wonderland t-shirt and has proceeded to start his cleaning. He starts a timer on his watch and he starts his cleaning. But you, you start to see little things here and there happening. So it'll show him cleaning, like sweeping the floor, mopping the floor, whatever. And the animatronics in the background like will move a little bit or they'll blink their eyes or something and he'll turn around and look at them and they won't move anymore, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> but it's just almost more funny than it is horrifying, for me at least. But this whole fucking time though, he's alone, he's in this creepy ass theme park and well, it's not even really a theme park, it's more like a Chuck E. Cheese. Did anybody else get total Chuck E. Cheese vibes from this movie? Cause it's just like this room, right? It's a restaurant and you go there, you eat and you have parties like birthday parties and stuff like that. And then you have like, here's this special, super happy fun room in the back where you can have special parties, which is fucking weird. But it was, but it was like that, you know, very Chuck E. Cheese like, I don't know. Do, do you, does everybody know what a Chuck E. Cheese is? It's basically just like a pizza joint. You go in. And they have a bunch of arcade games and they have these animatronic animals on a stage that sing. And it's very creepy. It's very, very creepy. I not, I've never understood why that was ever a fucking thing. Because it's just terrifying. He continues to clean and then you see him put the these cans in the refrigerator. So as far as I can tell, it said punch pop on it, I think. I thought I read a... I thought I read a review before where somebody called it an energy drink, but nowhere on it does it say that it's it's an energy drink. I believe it just says it's like punch pop or something, but he put several cans of that in the fridge and when his alarm goes off, it's break time. So he takes a break, he goes, grabs one of those punch pops and he starts drinking it and he notices in the corner of the kitchen that there's like this thing under a tarp. So he takes the tarp off and it's an old pinball machine. So he gets like really into this pinball machine. So during his breaks, he starts like cleaning it off and he's really focusing on that one machine and being really detail oriented about it. So in, to me, you know, I'm always watching a movie trying to guess what's gonna happen. I don't know why I do that. It doesn't ruin the movie for me, but I guess it makes it like a fun little game or something. But at this point in the movie, I was like, oh, he remembers this pinball machine. Maybe he was the kid in the beginning. <laughs> you know? I'm like totally trying to figure out why he was so enthralled with this pinball machine. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, that is not what happened. <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but then his alarm goes off again, break time is over, he crushes his can, he throws it away, and he heads back to work. Well, when he goes back to work this time, he's confronted by Ozzy the ostrich. It's like literally standing in the middle of the fucking room, staring at him. It's very awkward, but he's not scared. He doesn't do any, he doesn't even flinch. He just stares at it. And then it's like a, like a poking of the bear situation. He takes his mop and he like punches it almost. I don't know if like it was supposed to be him tapping it. Like, hey, are you are you moving? Are you alive? What's, what's happening? He's like poking it with his mop or whatever. It's very awkward. 
And then all of a sudden the fucking bird comes to life and starts attacking him. And he's not scared. He doesn't run away. He doesn't do anything. He just he just starts kicking its ass. He beats the shit out of it with the he breaks them up and he starts fucking beating the shit out of it. Just whoa, 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 just rapidly blood is squirting everywhere. But it's not like it, blood blood. It's not like red blood. It's more like a black blood. I don't know if they did that for the rating or if that's really what they thought like an animatronic blood would look like. It would be just like this black matter, maybe like oil or something. I have heard dirty rumors that back in the day, uh, certain production companies would prefer blood in a movie to be black because they could get away with a different rating than if it was red. If a movie had actual red blood, which looks more realistic, they would have to have a harsher rating. I don't think things are like that now, but I mean, it'd be interesting to dive into that and try and figure it out, but I don't know. But he just didn't seem surprised that this bird came to life, which was also feeding into my thought that he already knew about the animatronics that he was there for a reason, that's why I thought maybe he was the kid in the beginning and that that's why he knew about the pinball machine and all the things, but like I said, that's not, it's not at all what fucking happened. <laughs> but it also, like I said earlier, might tie into a good sequel. Like you, maybe you find out something about why he wasn't scared and you find out why he doesn't speak and maybe pull in those military name tags and, and Maybe he's uh, an, like he's on a mission to take care of business and Willy's Wonderland was on his list of places where he needed to clean up shop and that's why he's there, you know what I mean? So I don't know, there's like a lot of different ways you could take this, but that would be a really interesting story, I think. Okay, so after that happens, janitor's alarm goes off, break time, he grabs one of his pops out of the fridge and he cracks it open and then he goes back to cleaning the pinball machine. And then his alarm goes off again, break is over, he crushes his hand, throws it away. And then he heads to clean the bathroom. This scene, so they do kind of like a time lapse in this scene because the bathroom is fucked up. There's graffiti everywhere, like the urinals and toilets are disgusting. So they do a time lapse showing him cleaning the room. But when he's done, that bathroom looks fucking immaculate. It is like, it's, it's practically fucking sparkling. It is insane <laughs> how well of a job he did cleaning and he got all the graffiti off the walls. But then he hears music, so he leaves and he goes back into the stage, I'm gonna call it the stage room, it's like the main room where there's the stage with the animatronic characters and then, you know, the tables where people eat or out there. So he goes into the stage room and the animatronics are performing their little show where they're all like singing and like playing their instruments or whatever the fuck they're doing up there they're like singing and dancing or whatever which once again he he's not surprised about this at all so he turns like he flips some kind of switch and turns them off and then he just goes right back into the bathroom to finish cleaning well sure as shit there's like all of a sudden graffiti on the wall again and all of the bathroom doors slam and so he starts opening each bathroom door to see what's going on in there and this is this is where he meets Gus Gorilla. <laughs> Gus Gorilla comes out and like he starts beating the fuck out of the janitor cage. So he gets he gets a little beat up at this point. But I mean, in typical janitor fashion, he turns it around and he kills this motherfucker in one of the most gruesome ways. <laughs> So I don't know if anybody is, uh, has did, like recognized what happened here because it's kind of like, unless you were like kind, kind of paying attention, it's, it's a little hard to see what he does, but he basically <laughs> takes the monkey and puts his head on the urinal, like mouth open on the side of the urinal. And he kicks the back of his head all American history X style, like a, just a straight up fucking curb stomping or urinal stomping, if you will. <laughs> That's his face. And that's how he kills that motherfucker. <laughs> it's highly, highly entertaining and very gruesome. And then his alarm goes off and it's break time. So he grabs his pop and then he goes in and he starts filing his nails so that he can play this pinball machine. See, it's like this, 
It's like this routine that he already has in his back pocket specifically for this pinball machine. Like, I don't understand. Like, I wanted to know what was so important about it. And then his break, his little alarm goes off and his break is over. He crushes the scanner, throws away. Well, a truck pulls up to Willie's and it's, you know, the hooligan kids are back to burn the place down and Liv sees that sure as shit, the janitor is in Willie. So she knocks on the window and is like, hey, we need to get you out of there. You're not safe. And he just walks away. Like he doesn't even fucking care. One, they say that he's not safe. And two, that they're there to help him. He's just like, whatever, buy him. Which, I mean, clearly he can handle himself. So maybe he doesn't care. I don't know. Or he's there for a reason. The other hooligans just want to go and burn the place down, but she she wants to get him out because she's not going to feel good about burning the place down and him dying in there because that's pretty much the whole reason why they're there in the first place is to stop this place from fucking killing people in general. So she decides that she's going to she's gonna go in their solo cup and get him out and everyone else is going to wait outside. So she crawls in through the air ducts, I guess. Seem incredibly large. I... I'm not in plumbing or heating or electric or any of that shit. I don't know how ductwork happens. I don't know anything about it, but these air ducts are fucking huge. Like she's literally up on her hands and knees and just, and has so much space above her and beside her still. And she's just crawling around this motherfucker. So that's clearly a little unrealistic or this place just has the biggest ductwork of life because they have like huge air conditioners or something. I don't know. But anyway, she ends up encountering Artie the alligator, starts chasing her and to get away from him, she has to then go inside the building. So she crawls out through a register and then he can't, for some reason he can't fit through the register. Like the register is a normal, you know, small square hole that at least she's able to squeeze through, but Artie can't but yet the ducts on the inside are like these huge fucking four foot by four foot feet tunnel things. I don't fucking know. But when she enters the building, she encounters Serene, Serene Sarah, which this is one of the scarier parts of the movie because Sarah is very freaky deaky. She just, her overall look is very terrifying. This is one of the animatronics that has kind of the least amount of suit work going on. She has a mask. Well, she actually has two masks. She has one mask, which kind of looks normal, but then she has another mask where the mouth is all cut and she has like a bunch of sharp teeth and shit. But she's basically below that, just a person wearing clothing. But the way she moves is terrifying. There's one situation actually that happens right now in the movie where she crawls up the side or she crawls up the wall backwards. So that's kind of terrifying. But Nick ends up ultimately coming across Liv, which is kind of weird. She like falls on him from the sky or something. Like somehow she got away from Serene and just falls from the sky on top of him, which was kind of like, why? that's weird. Why couldn't she have just like jumped down or came from behind something? Like why'd she have to like fall on top of him? I don't know. I feel like they were trying to create like based off of how the, this movie ends, which clearly we're going to get to that, but how this movie ends, I feel like they were trying to build some kind of relationship between these two for some reason, but it just didn't really come off that great. But I think maybe this is one of those weird situations that they're like, oh, we're gonna have her drop from the sky and fall on top of him, and then all of a sudden sparks are gonna fucking fly or some shit. <laughs> I don't know. Ultimately, the other hooligans that are outside here live scream inside, so now they're going to go in and try and get her, but some of them don't want to, some of them do want to. They end up on the roof and they end up falling through the roof into the building anyway. And then clearly this this is when like mass slaughter happens. <laughs> People just start fucking dying left and right. But this is kind of one of the, the cooler parts of the movie because you get to see all the, you know, the animatronic, the different animatronics killing other people in different ways and stuff. You know, it's not just Nick Cage, the janitor, killing them. You're, you're seeing them kill other people. So here's, here's an aha moment for Liv and the hooligans is, so she sees Willie the Weasel on stage and she pulls out a knife and she starts running towards the stage to fucking kill him, right? She wants to stab him. She wants to kill him. Well, Cage stops her, stops her from doing this for some reason. See, there's something going on here. 
he stops her from doing it and we don't know why they they didn't explain it in the moment but it was almost like he wanted to be the one to kill him and he had his way of doing it and he's gonna kill one every time he takes a break or every time he's not on break or something i don't fucking know but Liv starts telling Cage the story of Willy's Wonderland and why he, well, she's basically trying to convince him into like letting her kill fucking Willy the Weasel. But there's this guy, his name was Jerry Robert Lewis. He was a sick, sadistic serial killer and he ran Willy's and he hired other sick people to run Willy's with him. And they themselves were killing people. They were taking them back into the super happy fun room, little private creepy fucking room, and they were killing kids and they were doing all this stuff while well, the cops caught on to them and they didn't want to be taken by the cops, so they decided that they were going to perform a satanic ritual and then they took their own lives. Clearly, the satanic ritual ended up being them transferring their souls into these animatronic figures. And then Tex, the cowboy, buys the place and he cleans it up and he tries to reopen it. Well the animatronics start killing people. So now they have this problem that they have to deal with where they need to stop these animal, these animatronics from killing people. So Tex closed Willie's and he made a deal with the devil, I guess. And that's kind of where the story ends. Nick goes back to cleaning and the kids kind of break off into two different groups. So there's like a couple who break off and they go into this super happy fun room and then they're gonna go make the sweet loves in there. Just fucking creepy. I mean, who who gets into a situation like this and then immediately thinks, oh, let's go have sex. I think that's a good idea. Cause it's always them motherfuckers that end up dying, right? And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, the animatronics start singing again and the kids just go up and start watching it. They know what's going on here. They know, right? And they just go up and they're watching it. And of course, one of the kids gets stabbed through the fucking chest by an animatronic. And then it's break time. <laughs> the janitor goes, grabs one of his pops, starts playing pinball. And the other kids are making sweet loves in the super happy fun room. And then all of a sudden, Artie the alligator shows up. And the one girl says, was he there this whole time? And then the boy's like, I don't know. Yeah, of course he was, whatever. And then they keep making the sweet loves. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. So there's another one of the hooligans that ran and hid and he had a cell phone and he called the sheriff's office and she picks it up and he's like, hey, we're at Willie's, we need help. And she just kind of hangs up on him. Well, and then he calls back and he's like, hello, we need help. And then, then she decides to grab a deputy and go. But this is kind of where you also get the feeling that something's a little weird there too so clearly the sheriff knows what's going on at willie's and for some reason isn't trying to help but she is going to go over there with the deputy and see what's going on and then another a different kid gets eaten by the turtle and serene and the knight is attacking another girl and then boom the janitor's break is over he crushes up his can he throws it away and he goes and he goes in and starts beating the knight's head against a wall and he chops his head off with an axe and then the alligator attacks the the love making kids and kills them all the time all of this time Liv is just sitting there watching all of this she she watched cage kill the knight and then she hears her friend screaming because at this point the alligator already the alligator is attacking her friend so she runs to the door that of the room that they're in and then nick kicks the door down and they're watching the alligator attack these two kids, the two kids that were making the sweet loves. So he goes in and he, he kills the alligator, which is it's kind of cool the way he kills this one. He grabs the top of the alligator's jaw and the bottom of the alligator's jaw and he's like pulling them apart. He's like ripping like the head in half and then he reaches down the throat and he rips out some kind of animatronic thing, which ultimately ends up killing it. We cut to the sheriff is on the way to Willie's now, and she's kind of telling the deputy the story about Willie's, which part of it we've already heard, but then she she elaborates a little bit, and maybe this is this part of the story Liv didn't know about, but she she's talking about how the townspeople knew about Willie's, they knew there, it, that it was bad news, so they hired a contractor to go tear the place down, 
but the the animatronics killed him and then they couldn't get anybody else to take the job after that so the town just decided to let sleeping dogs lie they were just they just left willies alone they were like we're just gonna leave it alone we're not gonna do anything but then the tronics which is what i'm gonna call them from now on because animatronics is just too long of a word for me. But the Tronics started leaving Willies and going out in the town and started killing people around town. So now they've got a problem. Now Willies Wonderland characters are out killing the townspeople. So they made them a deal. They went in and they told the characters that if they would stop leaving Willies and eating the townsfolk, that they would feed them. Because apparently when you transfer your soul into the body of a robot, you're hungry, <laughs> I guess. <clears throat> but they made this deal. This is the deal with the devil that they made that they would feed them. So now any outsiders that came in, um, any people that wouldn't be missed, any people with low moral character or just even simply wrong place, wrong time, like the janitor, they would feed to these things. But one of the families that they fed to Willy's Wonderland had a kid with them and the kid ended up living through the night, which ultimately in the end ended up being Liv. And the sheriff was there when they found her. So of course the sheriff took Liv in and kind of raised her as her own daughter. You get the slight feeling that the sheriff has feelings for her like you know, she doesn't want her to die. She wants to protect her. She wants to do all these things, but Liv is clearly upset and knows a little bit about her past and wants to do something about it. So there you get the full story of what's going on here and why, why the sheriff decided not to ignore the kids and let them die. Why she decided, okay, let's go figure out what's going on because she knows Liv is there and she wants, I guess she wants to save her. So now we're in a situation where Liv finds the chameleon, which had killed another, had killed the the hooligan that called the police in the first place and here comes the janitor cage and he steps up beside her like he's gonna protect her and he's gonna kill this thing well his alarm goes off it's break time so this is where i was telling you earlier that he took this shit seriously so he he peaced the fuck out he went and go got his pop cracked it open and then he started playing pinball and just kind of left Liv to her own devices with this character that's trying to kill her. But these scenes are getting more and more erratic. So every time Cage goes back to play this pinball machine, this is where, you know, he's getting he's getting his freaky deaky out. This is where he's doing his acting performances, his just outrageous acting performances. He starts dancing while he's playing this thing and he's doing all these like arm movements and he's spinning around in circles as he's playing this pinball machine like it's the most like the happiest time of his life like he's just having the best time playing this fucking pinball machine <laughs> and then his alarm goes up breaks over crushes can throws it in the garbage can the funny thing too about this movie in in these break scenes is Whenever he fights one of the animatronics and he kills them and he gets blood all over his shirt, he'll go back to the broom closet and grab another shirt and put on a clean shirt. So then when he goes back to work after his breaks, he's all like fresh to death. <laughs> and then he goes and he ultimately ends up killing the chameleon and saving Liv, I think. Well, he grabs the, the chameleon and then he drags her down the hallway and he kicks open the front door and he goes outside and then the sheriff is waiting for him and she tells everybody to go back inside and she goes inside and she starts apologizing to Willie. She goes at like he, Willie the weasel is still on the stage. He's pretty much been on stage this whole time. He hasn't done shit yet. And she walks up to him and she starts apologizing to fucking Willie the weasel, the animatronic motherfucker that's just watching all this go down because she's trying to keep the peace, you know, the quote unquote peace. She's trying to, to stick with their pact that they made that they will still continue to feed them if they don't leave willies to kill everyone else. See, at this point, you, I guess you're supposed to assume that the janitor and Liv and everybody doesn't know that part about this. So she goes in and she's apologizing to Willie and she handcuffs the janitor and she takes Liv and they leave and Liv's like freaking out. She's like, no, I'm not leaving unless we take him with us. We can't leave him here to die. But in, in the end, they end up just leaving him there. And he's like on his knees, handcuffed. And he didn't end up killing the chameleon. He didn't have a chance yet. So the chameleon is still alive. 
and Serene is there, and then it's him left in this room. And then all of a sudden, there's like this face-off between him and these two characters, and it's to the tune of head, shoulders, knees, and toes. <laughs> so that's another thing that I loved about this movie is the, mu the background music is just so appropriate. There's like a Willie's theme song, and they play these childish songs like head, shoulders, knees, and toes that, you know, they jam out to and they do the cereal slaughtering to. That is super cool about this movie. But he ends up headbutting Serene. And then he like chest bumps the frog. And then you see uh, the sheriff puts Liv in the deputy's car and she tells them to take off that, but she's gonna stay and watch over the place and make sure that Willie kills the janitor and that all is well with their pact and everything. So while that's happening, it flashes back inside to the janitor and it just, <laughs> all you see is like feet kicking and then the camera pans over and the janitor is sitting on top of Serene and he, I don't know if he like breaks her neck, but he essentially breaks her neck with his ass because he's still handcuffed, you know. But then this part, he somehow breaks his handcuffs, which looked like just rope at that point. So there's like a little continuity, not continuity error, but there's like, yeah, maybe a continuity error, error where he's supposed to be in handcuffs in the beginning and then in the end he's in ropes and he just breaks them. Because I doubt he can just break handcuffs, but it, I don't know. Whatever, it doesn't even fucking matter because he then goes and literally twists the head off of the chameleon and fucking kills it. As Liv and the deputy are driving off, Tito the turtle finds them and he starts fucking attacking them and he kills the deputy, but then Liv ends up just fucking stabbing him to, I don't wanna say to death because it didn't really look like she killed him but she beats him up with the fucking butt of a shotgun pretty bad. So I think we're to assume at this point Liv is like on her way back to Willie's. And as this is happening, the janitor is doing his janitorial duties and he continues to clean up. He's cleaning up the bodies. He He's bagging the characters that have been killed and he's putting them in trash bags and taking them out to the dumpster. And then he does end up cleaning up the bodies of the kids that have died too. And then I think we're, I think he's almost done cleaning at this point. The the place looks fucking spotless and he just walks up to the stage and he just starts staring at Willie, the weasel, because he is the only one at this point that has not left that fucking stage. So he knows, he knows that at some point he's going to have to face off with this motherfucker. So he's just staring at him almost like a, I'm, I'm ready. Let's fucking go. This place is clean. My, my job is done and you're the only motherfucker left. So let's go. Well, Alarm goes off, break time. I don't know about you, but he gets more breaks than anybody I have ever known in a job. <laughs> goes, grabs his pop, pops it open, and then he starts playing pinball, and he's jamming and dancing out again. He's clapping his hands. He's rolling his head. He's doing these weird hand movements again. He's just having a jolly good old fucking time. Then his alarm goes off, break is over, and he goes to take the trash out. <laughs> And he waves at the sheriff because she's still out there. <laughs> and she's like, what the fuck? Like, why is he still alive? What the fuck? <laughs> it's, just, it's straight comedy. But the sheriff, of course, still trying to keep the pack, takes him back inside to feed him to Willie. But of course, you know, Willie, he's ready to fight now. He's, he's done standing around doing nothing. Standing around doing nothing. He's letting all of his friends do all the work and Willie's standing around doing absolutely fucking nothing. Well, he walks up, I don't want to say he walks up to the sheriff, but he goes, anyway, he ends up in face to face with the sheriff. She probably walked up to him, whatever. But he just fucking slashes her right across the stomach and it basically splits her in half and her top half goes flying and her legs just fall because he has these like massive claws. And then he fucking attacks the janitor and throws him against the wall and, and starts slashing him with these huge claws. So at this point, you're kind of like, oh, fuck, you know, Nick Cage is going to die right now. <laughs> of course, that would never happen. You can't kill the cage. <laughs> you can't escape the cage. I just created Nicolas Cage's tagline. You can't escape the cage. Get it? Because like, you could be trapped in a cage. Whatever. <laughs> Nick Cage's new tagline, you can't escape the cage. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, he gets 
clawed the fuck up by this thing. He gets thrown into the ball pit. And then he doesn't come back up. So, you know, Willie looks in there to see if he's, like, dead or not. I don't know if he thought he was dead or what. But the janitor or Nick Cage or whatever the fuck you want to call him at this point. I believe I've been calling him all the things. He climbs out. And he goes and he grabs his soda. Well, his pop. I guess, whatever. It's really hard for me to call it pop. I'm, I'm a soda girl. I call it soda. What do you guys call it? Do you call it pop or do you call it soda? I heard it was regional, but according to my region, I'm supposed to be calling it pop, and I don't. I call it soda. So it's really hard to call it pop. But he goes and he grabs this pop, and he puts it in a bag. <laughs> and then he grabs these two wooden sticks, and he tapes them together. And then it's showdown time. So they face off, and then the janitor, Nick Cage, starts beating Willie with his bag of pops. <laughs> beating him with his bag of pops and he's beating him with these sticks and he like just legit beats him to death with the shit and then he rips his fucking head off and throws it on the ground bye bye willy no more willies <laughs> no more willies are you guys gonna miss willies <laughs> are you guys gonna miss the willies I keep trying to make this an appropriate joke. It has not landed not once this whole fucking time. Um, where was I at? I'm <laughs> getting so sucked into these Willie's jokes that are not funny. I'm forgetting wearing that. Oh, so outside, ripping ass in Cage's car. <laughs> Tex is not farting in Cage's car. He's outside burning rubber, I guess. I, I, he's ripping around the parking lot. So he's ripping ass around the parking lot in the janitor's car. He's ripping ass in his car. He was farting away. He's farting around in his car. No, I'm kidding. But he stayed, he stayed good with his part of the deal, I guess, which, you know, kind of makes you wonder why, because so far all the way up to this point, they normally take people there to sacrifice them to the Willie's characters and they die. So the fact that he even bothered to bring the janitor's car back at this point it is, I don't know why, why they would do that, but Tex brings his car back and then the tow truck guy, I, sh I don't know what his fucking name is. I'm just going to call him the tow truck guy because who cares? <laughs> They're outside. They pull up outside and they start talking and they're like, okay, well, are you ready to go in there? Ready to see what happened? What's crapping in? You know, ready to go clean up shop? I guess they're the cleanup crew. So at this point, you get a little sneaky peek into the dumpster and somebody's peeking out of one of the garbage bags. Blink, 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 blink. So, <coughs> oh my God. One of the characters did not die. But Tex and the tow truck guy, they go inside to check it out and the place is fucking spotless. Like I said, once again, it practically fucking sparkles when you walk in there. And then it cuts to Cage, the janitor. He's in, I don't know if he's in the broom closet or what, but he's putting on his leather jacket because he's done. His job is done for the day. And he walks out and he sees Tex and the tow truck guy standing there and he knows. He knows these motherfuckers sent him there to die. And they walk out and they give him the keys and he jumps in the car to the tune of free bird because <laughs> he's free as a bird now because <laughs> he fucking lived right well and here here's the part that's a little this is what i was talking about earlier where i felt like they were trying to build a relationship or a connection between the janitor and Liv because he's in his car and he's ready to piece the fuck out to the tune of free bird and he looks out and Liv is just fucking standing there she's all by herself right because now she doesn't have anybody. The sheriff is gone. That was the person who was like taking care of her. Her parents were killed a long time ago at Willie's. So she's just kind of standing there and they just have this eye contact. And you can tell based off of facial expressions, he was just kind of like, okay, yeah, sure. So she goes over and she gets in his car with him. And then they drive off squealing tires, you know, not before he, the janitor gives Tex and the tow truck guy, you know, the, the good fuck you look like, I know what you did, but I lived and I'm here and fuck you. Bye. <laughs> but they drive off together. So it's just, it's weird because it leaves you to think that maybe there should have been some kind of relationship there, 
but it just really wasn't built up throughout the movie to be that way. So another movie that kind of has this same ending is From Dust Till Dawn, the first one. So at the end of that movie, there's Juliette Lewis's character and George Clooney's character, and they're the only two left alive. And they go outside and you're like, oh, okay, he's going to take her with him now, right? Because they've been through this huge ordeal and they actually did spend a good majority of that movie building up those two characters' relationships. But ultimately, in, in the end of that movie, he didn't take her, which I kind of felt like was the more, I don't want to say classy thing to do, but maybe the more respectful thing to do because he wasn't going to a great place. I guess we don't know where the janitor was going. He was probably just, you know, headed back on his way to wherever he was going in the beginning. But George Clooney's character gives Juliette Lewis's character a shit ton of money, and he's just like, sorry, kid, you can't come with me. You know, I'm not going to a good place. You're not old enough. Here's some fucking money. Make it. And then he, he fucking peels off and he leaves. And then you see her leave, you know, and they go their separate ways. But you kind of know that she's going to be okay. He gave her a shit ton of money, and he's going to his safe place, so he's fine. But in this movie she gets in the car and he takes her with him. So then what happens to them after this? Do they become a couple? Do they get married? Does he ever speak to her? Like, what if he's some kind of weirdo with some weird sexual fetishes or something? Or are they just friends that went through this traumatic thing together and now they're just gonna, they're gonna go on adventures and do other things to get, like maybe he's headed to the next Willy's Wonderland not necessarily Willy's, but maybe some other kind of theme park situation where the same satanic shit happens and now she's his like cohort or something. I don't know what was up with that, but she ends up getting in the car and leaving with him. And then the tow truck driver and Tex are like, fuck yeah, it's over. We don't have to do this anymore. He killed them all and we're like fucking golden, right? So they're like, let's go celebrate. They jump in Tex's car and they're about ready to peace out and go have some beers. Well, here, here comes Serene. She fucking blows him up. <laughs> but I think in turn, essentially blows herself up too because she goes flying off the back of the car. But you don't actually see her die. So maybe in the sequel, she's alive and the janitor and Liv have to come back and take care of her. I don't know. We're about to, we're about to end the movie here. Um, we go back into the janitor's car and they're just kind of, him and Liv are sitting there not saying words to each other. And he goes to grab one of his pops and he opens it and he's about to take a drink and he looks at her and he you can kind of tell he's like oh shit you know there's this other person now I gotta I gotta be respectful I guess and he hands her his pop and she grabs it and takes a drink and then roll credits movie's over ah, what a fun ride that was right the kills in, the, in this movie were so gruesome and so bloody blood spurting everywhere and it's just so much fun. It's just such a fun movie. If you if you take anything away from this movie, it's just it's an it's a wild entertaining ride. And that's all it was meant to be. So, I'm going to read some reviews on this movie, but like I said, all you really need to take away is that it was supposed to be fun. It was supposed to be entertaining. It's not supposed to take itself seriously. You know, it's all of those things. So, I'm going to read some reviews here. Uh, the Topaz Caravan gave it one star and it says, I was so excited for this film. The trailer looked amazing. It had real FNAF vibes. I believe that's Fun Night at Freddy's or whatever that fucking video game is or whatever. And it gave me high expectations. Then to learn the main actor was Nicolas Cage, I thought, hell yeah, this will be a movie of the year. They've got all the ingredients to make a top-notch film. Shame they didn't, it says, shame they didn't lack of story. Uh, I'm assuming that's supposed to say it's a shame because the story was lacking. And then it says, all the jump scares didn't build tension. The acting was seriously cheesy. If you were aiming for gold, old, I should have read this first because it is full of errors. It says, if you were... If you was aiming for gold old cheese, then Nicolas Cage's character was not right. It had way too many time fillers. This film had potential, but clearly the producers, writers didn't. So basically, I'm assuming that was just supposed to say 
uh, if they were aiming for a good old cheesy horror film, Nicolas Cage was not right for the part, and it had way too many time fillers, it took too many breaks, and um, it had it had potential, but they failed. I guess is what I'm getting out of all of that. Uh, alas, if you was making Cage a mute, give us a reason why. Once again, I'm assuming that just means if uh, if you're gonna make somebody speechless, maybe tell us why he can't speak or why he refuses to speak. I never took to the internet to complain about a film, but this one just annoyed me. I spent days excited for this film to get halfway through it, expecting it got better, and then it just flops. So that's what that person had to say. Uh, Slime Support Studios also gave it one star. This film basically really rushed Five Nights at Freddy. Oh, Five Nights at Freddy. <laughs> Why do people gotta put acronyms? Not everybody knows what the fuck F-N-A-F is supposed to fucking mean, you know? This film was basically a really rushed Five Nights at Freddy fan story, but the story made no sense and it it's only about a guy beating up robots with a cliche everybody dies concept because everyone was too lazy to come up with something creative or put at least a little effort to making the character characters likable. We seriously don't know anything about the... Pro the protagonist, other than he doesn't talk and he beats robots up. I watched this movie with my entire family, and while we all have different tastes, we all found this to be a total waste of time. It did have a few elements that made it a little interesting, but overall it was nothing but a shameless, edgy cash grab. The acting could be better too. We noticed this film was supposed to be ironic, but it was handled so badly it felt unfunny and awkward. Oh. That's your opinion, bro. <laughs> Chase Long gave it five stars and it says, listen, let me start off by saying this movie is one of a kind Mona Lisa like masterpiece. Nicolas Cage, AKA the janitor, doesn't even say a word the entire movie, beautiful. The animatronics all had their own personality traits and all felt alive and different, stunning, really. The way Nick Cage fought his way through every tough scenario in different ways really shows the creativity in this movie and how cool Nick Cage is. This is a movie to just turn on with a few friends and not take too seriously and overanalyze. It's lighthearted and fun. The pinball scenes are a classic already. I give this movie a 10 out of 10. Would watch it again, hoping for a sequel. Just want to say blank you to Clint Worthington for your review on this Snatch Hit. I did look for that review because I was curious as to what the big fuck you was about, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> so sorry about that. Michael Aaron Harris gave it four stars. Not any piece of cinematic masterpiece, but it's funny, cheesy, action thriller based and haunted Chuck E. Cheese starring Nick Cage. See, yeah, that's what I said too. I thought the set design was incredible though. The animatronics were puppeted, puppeted well and visually looked great for what they were portraying. I could see these being real robots. At some parts, the robots looked fairly obvious people in suits. There were some story elements that seemed like they were going to get an explanation, but went nowhere. His soda, for example, soda, but it pop, <laughs> was a Popeye spinach type of deal where the janitor would drink it on a timer to stay strong. I assumed he had some sort of advantage blood sugar issue that happened to give him great strength while his body is pumped full of sugar, but who knows? I think overall the movie felt like a cheesy 80s action thriller and was very entertaining. So, I mean, I kind of agree. I agree with that review. There was a lot of elements in the story that did not get an explanation, but Considering maybe they were setting this movie up for a sequel, why would they explain those things? Maybe they had every intention of explaining them in a sequel. So there were two bad reviews and two good reviews. Um, I'd like to give you my review. You know how I do it here on My Killer Podcast. A movie either kills it, it's a fun little ditty, or it's street trash, just straight garbage. Uh, of course, this movie killed it for me. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. You should love it too. Go spend some money on it. Hopefully, we can get a better release. If they decide to do a special edition release of this Blu-ray in a steelbook or 
a media book or even just give this movie a fucking slipcover, I will be buying it again. Um, the, the kill award in this movie is going to go to Gus Gorilla with the American History X style slaying. That was horrifying. <laughs> I didn't hear anybody talk about that. I didn't see any reviews re referencing that fucking kill. Maybe I need to go back and watch it. Maybe I saw something that didn't actually happen. I don't know, but that's what it looked like to me that happened. So that gets the fucking kill award. And I am going to throw out a favorite scene. I don't have a favorite quote of this movie because there wasn't a lot of quoting going on. I'm sure if Nicolas Cage had any lines, maybe I would have a favorite quote from him, but... Uh, I am going to throw out a favorite part of this movie. I, I love the pinball scenes, the pinball machine scenes where he's fucking dancing and doing his Nick Cage styly performance, just way wacky out there, all freaky deaky styly. You know how I love that from my cage. So next time on My Killer Podcast, we are going to be talking about the movie Raw Head Rex. So Look forward to seeing that. Go watch that movie so we can have a talk about it in the fucking next episode. <laughs> I'm a hot mess express. You know how we do around here. If you want to help support the show and support me and keep these dreams alive y'all on over to itunes and give me five stars and some beautiful words also check out the youtube episode of this podcast if you want to support the show there like subscribe and kill that bell so we can get the word out there about this fun little show also share it with your friends if you think they'd be interested in learning a little bit about this movie once again thank you so much for joining me and have a killer day peace